So, I've asked Amanda, uh, Amanda Meek works with us. Amanda's going to be my technical assistant because, uh, quite frankly, I'll probably be back in the Ontario Power Generating now. They have to do it. Good morning. My name is Howard Titus, and I do work for Coban Energy. And I would like to thank uh, the Clarington Board of Trade for allowing us the opportunity to come and speak to you folks today. Uh, I'd like to introduce Amanda Meek. Amanda Meek uh, works with us at uh, Coban Energy. And thank you very much to uh, OPG for such lovely surroundings, as well as a great host community to work in. Covana, we have a culture that every major meeting starts with a safety contact. And so here we'll be on a conference call, and before the call goes too far, we always start talking about safety. And it could be, you know, winter driving safety, it could be lockout, tagout, it could be heavy equipment safety, all things that impact our employees and our ability to come to work. And when I was thinking about this, I thought, well, you know, one of the things that you talk about in safety is about accidents, and what, are, what is an accident? And so Covana actually has a pretty good structure of what we view an accident as. An accident is anything that's an unplanned event, disrupts activities, and affects people. Common causes of accidents are pattern of unsafe behaviors, and my wife really gets upset when I bring up things about tailgating and that. Uh, failure to pay attention, which is back to the tailgating, or exceeding one's capabilities. Uh, from our chairman, Tony Orlando, he makes it abundantly clear to us that nothing is more important than the safety uh, and the environment, not, not the production, not throughputs, nor profits. This was an op-ed piece of the New York uh, Times, and it talks a little bit about the uh, business that we're in. The business that uh, uh, Provent Energy is in is in energy recovery from waste. And the Europeans and a lot of the Asian nations are leading us uh, on their ability to recover waste and divert waste from landfills and recover the, uh, the resources from the waste. And this talks here about the U.S. But as you see as we go through the presentation, both Canada and U.S. kind of share the same uh, uh, statistics around that. So this is kind of an overview of what our facility looks like. Um, this is a general Covanta design, very, very standard to how we would operate a facility or build a facility. Uh, we have 45 facilities in North America. And of the 45 facilities that we have in North America, about 30 of them are of this design, facilities that we actually built. Let me see if I can make this thing work. Uh, there we go. Some of these buildings are cleaner. I don't think my laser pointer is working very well. Oh, there we go. So the trash is brought in uh, uh, curbside. This plant here that we're building across the road, it'll receive what was called post-recycle trash. So the trash is picked up at everybody's homes. It goes to a uh, transfer station. The transfer station will take out any of the large bulky items, things that they can see very readily. The material will then be delivered to our facility. This whole area is kept under a negative pressure. We'll have high speed doors on there so when the trucks come in, the doors close immediately. We keep that area under a negative pressure at all time. And that controls odors uh, so we have no odors. You'll be able to walk right up to any part of our facility and you will not smell any odors. Material is put on the floor. Once an hour, we'll actually spread the material on the floor and look at the, uh, what's coming in and ensuring that the waste that we're receiving is the waste that we're permitted to receive by the Ministry of the Environment. The material is pushed off into a pit, and there's a crane operator that's going to drive this crane up and down, and he's going to do it from our main control room, and he'll have an overview of the pit, and he does a couple of things. A big part of that role is, is to actually keep that pit uh, stirred up, uh, mixed up. Garbage is not what you would call a homogeneous fuel. So it has to be mixed on a continuous basis to make sure the sizing's right, the fuel, uh, the heat rate is right. So those folks are fairly well trained individuals and they just sit there and they watch the uh, trash coming in and they know well if they see large large amounts of this, they'll, they'll mix it in together. <coughs> the, excuse me. The uh, overhead crane is, uh, then takes the waste from the pit and then puts it into our feed chute. Feed chute is gravity fed. It provides an air seal for the boiler. The waste travels down to our stoker. And the stoker on this plant, or we use Martin Great technology, which we're the licensees of. And this is, we view as probably one of the best technologies uh, available. 
uh, the stoker will push the, uh, the waste off and then there's a drying zone in the combustion process, an ignition zone, combustion zone, combustion zone, and a burnout zone. We will reduce that waste to less than 2% carbon as it's going, as, it, as, we're, as we're processing it. Out of the back comes uh, what we refer to as bottom ash. Bottom ash is completely inert, particularly <coughs> if it's below 10% carbon. Ours will be at 2%, but it has some really valuable stuff in it. It has steel and it has uh, ferrous. We'll talk a little bit about that. But that ferrous and steel will go through a, a, a transfer system to our residue handling building. In our residue handling building, we will recover the ferrous and the uh, non-ferrous products, and then that mill will go back for being reused again. As the heat is generated in the boiler, it goes through the process, but it's one of the things that we do in our plants is that we take the flue gas off of the back end of the combustion process and reintroduce it into the furnace. And as we reintroduce it into the furnace, we inject 19% uh, aqueous ammonia, not much more potent than um, uh, Mr. Clean. And we inject that in there, and that controls nitrous oxide production on the facility. So as the heat travels through the boiler, we will make steam at 1,350 PSI, 900 degrees Fahrenheit. That steam will be just like a traditional power plant, unlike, not unlike what uh, hydro does. Steam will come off of our boiler, we'll go through our turbine, the turbine will spin a gearbox, the gearbox will spin the generator, and then that will go to, um, uh, to the grid. We will produce about 17 and a half megawatts on our facility. The heat that we, uh, the, uh, the remaining energy that's in the steam and the water goes, what we call an air-cooled condenser. The air-cooled condenser takes just outside ambient air, blows it over the tubes, recondenses that steam so we can reuse the water in the boiler process. Our facility across the road will be a zero discharge facility. The only water that will leave our site will be sanitary water or uh, 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 rain water, storm water. We're actually working with our client, the region of Durham and the region of York, on looking at ways to harvest the rainwater for in-process water. <coughs> As the flue gas goes through the boiler, it goes through a gas conditioning tower, and in the gas conditioning system, we add carbon and we'll add lime. Carbon is for mercury capture, lime is for acid gases. The flue gas continues along, and we'll also take any of the unspent residue that's out of our air pollution control plant bag house, We'll take that residue and also reintroduce it in the reactor so we can recover any of the reagents and use all the reagents uh, that's available, reducing the amount of material that goes to landfill. The uh, material continues, the flue gas continues through the process through a bag house, and a bag house is really like a very large vacuum cleaner, very large, very expensive vacuum cleaner. <coughs> through the bag house, it'll go through reduced draft fans and out the stack. <coughs> There is a residue that we generate in here, and it's called APC residue. That residue, if it's not treated, is viewed as hazardous in Ontario. It is non-hazardous in the United States. However, if it is treated and encapsulated, and we will use pozzolan and cement to encapsulate it, that will stabilize that material before it goes to landfill. We'll be able to treat it and treat it as a non-haz waste. That is the basic cycle. Now we're going to show a movie. Hopefully.
Thank you very much. Great job. <laughs> so in, uh, I joined actually in the early part of the spring, and by the time I got on site, this is what we actually seen, and you, you will see as we uh, go through the process, or go through the presentation, you'll see the plants advance considerably. This area here is our tip building uh, prior to the uh, being sheeted. This is the residue handling building where the cranes are. This is our boiler building, air pollution control, and around the corner there eventually you'll see our residue handling building. I don't think the residue handling building was up at that point. Covana is the world's leader in energy from waste. We have operate about 45 plants around the world. We have facilities uh, in uh, China, we have facilities in the United States, Canada, and in the UK. We uh, have over 3,500 uh, employees that work for the company, and building the facility across the road, it has been uh, really quite a nice experience, and is that anything that I needed an expert in, I can find within the Covada organization heavy equipment, condition, uh, continuous emissions monitoring, environmental. Uh, the annual capacity of Covent is that we convert about 20 million tons of, uh, of waste on an annual basis and make about 9 million megawatt hours uh, of clean energy. And that's enough to, uh, for 1 million homes. We process about 65% of the United States EFW capacity. So we're a fairly large player in the U.S. market. And that is our portfolio. You'll see that a large part of our concentration is in the New England states, Florida. Uh, we have some operations in Ca uh, California. We have a facility in Burnaby, uh, uh, the Durham, York facility. And believe it or not, we have a facility in Honolulu, and that's our most difficult plant to staff people. Like, <laughs> nobody wants to move to Hawaii after being <laughs> I want to give it a shot, but what the <clears throat> This was kind of a great day for us. This happened in June. I remember we all came out of our offices to watch this happen. Uh, what you see there, oh, I'm sorry. What you see there is the loading end of our 20 megawatt steam turbine and gearbox. As opposed to the hydro uh, nuclear generation turbine, this thing was quite small. But uh, for us, it was quite a big day to actually watch that go into position and be in installed. And that's an area here is the actual generator building here. The European Union and the United States EPA have both concluded that the following is the waste management hierarchy that makes the most sense and maximizes energy savings and minimizes greenhouse gases. First and most obvious, we need to reduce. We need to reduce what we throw out. We probably need to reduce what we consume. Reuse. Um, my wife is really good at making me reuse paper bags and plastic bags. And and, and, you know, if you don't, you just wind up in a landfill, you take another one. Recycle and compost, we're becoming much, much more uh, uh, aware of our obligations on recycling and composting. Recovery is the fourth bar that Covana likes to talk about, and the, and the European Union and the uh, US EPA discuss about too. After you've reduced, after you've reused, after you recycle, there are things that you cannot do anything possible with. Um, I remember a, a number of years ago, an individual from the Sierra Legal Fund spoke to us and talked about uh, that greasy pack of Snyder's bacon when you're all done with it. You know, what do you do with that plastic wrap? There's no end use for this. There's no recovery of it. It has to go someplace. So the options are landfill or energy from waste. Those are our two disposal options at this time. EFWs help solve one of the largest challenges that we have. We have challenges around energy, and we have challenges around waste. Uh, the energy from waste uh, provides sustainable, provides a sustainable, uh, 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 pardon, the energy from waste provides sustainable, safe disposal for, for uh, uh, complements recycling. Uh, Covana facilities, we recycle about 430,000 tons of ferrous material on an annual basis. And we like to say that is equivalent to about 19 ambassador bridges, nine Golden Gate bridges, I think I heard uh, 12 Lionsgate bridges. 
as well as one billion beverage cans on an annual basis to recover from our facilities. We also produce enough renewable energy for the, uh, for the city of Electra, uh, Toronto, as well as have about a billion, uh, nine billion pounds of steam left over. Energy from waste facilities are net reducers of greenhouse gas. Landfills are one of the greatest generators of methane gas. Uh, methane gas is about 25% or 25 times more potent than uh, carbon dioxide. By taking the material to our facilities, we treat it, uh, we combust it, and the methane is not generated at the landfill. We recover the uh, metals, which uh, does a couple of things from an energy or from an environmental point of view. One, you're not transporting the steel and the ferrous material back and forth to waste disposal sites. The other thing is when you uh, purchase steel, somebody has to make it, the raw material, so we displace all that energy. Um, as well as uh, we can we reduce by, by, uh, by sending our material to an energy from waste plant and uh, versus a green or versus a landfill, we'll reduce greenhouse gas emissions by about 20 million tons per year. On a global perspective, there are about a thousand energy from waste facilities. And if you look at the uh, table or the graph in front of you, you will see that the two areas that really do lead the world in this are the Europeans and some of the Asian nations, Singapore, Japan, Taiwan, and China. Uh, Canada and the US kind of are the leaders in landfilling. Uh, and the reason why is that we've had very large amounts of land, very cheap, very easy to bury it. Uh, we also are probably one of the poorer group on recycling. Communities that are large, or countries and communities that use uh, uh, energy from waste, are also the ones that are the leaders in recycling and recovery. The Austria, uh, they're at, uh, they're, they're probably one of the world's leaders. Austria, Sweden, and Germany. Uh, Austria, if you look there, their recycling is above uh, seventy percent, and about thirty percent of their uh, rest of their waste goes to energy from waste facilities. Pretty nice balance if you can get yourself there. <laughs> we view as a company Ontario as a very large market for us. Ontario generates about 12 and a half million uh, tons of waste on an annual basis. 75% of that goes to landfill. Not all of the landfill here in, um, in Canada or in Ontario, some of it goes to the U.S. 23% of it is recycled, which is relatively low, and 2% of it goes to the energy effort waste business. 9.4 million tons of renewable energy is waste as a resource is being wasted, as well as we're also adding about 9.4 million tons of greenhouse gas to the environment. So as I said earlier, you kind of have two choices. After you've recycled and put the newspapers in the right bin and put the plastic bottles in the right bin, you've got two choices for your waste. One is to a landfill. Landfills are the most major, one of the major sources of methane. Their methane is about 25 uh, times more potent than carbon dioxide. They generate leachate in the groundwater and contamination. The land use is not sustainable. Eventually that hole will fill up and you'll have to dig another hole. And the energy that you can recover off of a landfill facility is about 65 kilowatts per ton of waste. Energy from waste facilities, 90% of the waste is reduced by volume. The energy we generate is clean. We recover the metals, we recycle. And we offset about an average of one car, a ton of carbon dioxide equivalent to about one ton of every ton of waste process. The renewable energy from an energy from waste facility is about 550 kilowatts per uh, ton of waste. The facility we're building across the road, uh, the guaranteed commitment on it, I believe, is 767 kilowatts per ton of This was taken, though, I would say mid-June, and you'll notice the architecture of the roof of our, uh, of our uh, air pollution control plant. The building is actually quite a, a, a pleasing building for the eye. What you see in there is uh, the air pollution control plant before we've loaded in any of the equipment. The interesting part of building these facilities is that 
that when they're building them, they kind of build the super uh, uh, structure and shell around it, and everything gets loaded in. They're almost built from the center out. Right? <clears throat> if you're looking at sources of electricity, coal is one of the largest generators of greenhouse gases. Oil, natural gas, even solar, nuclear, and wind have some, uh, some uh, over the life cycle, have generation of greenhouse gases. Because energy from waste displaces methane from uh, landfills, we are a net reducer of greenhouse gases. And that is based on a study done by uh, uh, in Japan. Emissions from an uh, energy from waste facility are also far below in every category. CO2, we're much better than landfill, uh, coal, oil. We're on par with natural gas. Sulfur dioxide, we're better than landfills, coal, and oil. Nitrous oxides, uh, we're better than landfills, uh, coal, and oil. And particulate matter, we're better than landfills, coal, and oil. Communities in Europe that have uh, moved to the uh, energy from waste model, uh, there's always been a, a, a bit of a, a, a concern around energy from waste plants. It's called feeding the beast, that when you build one of these facilities, that your communities will not recycle as, uh, as, as much as they should. But since 1997 to 2010, this chart shows us that communities in Europe that have moved to, to energy from waste, the landfilling rate has dropped, the red bar, dropped from about 64% down to about uh, 38%. You will see an increase in the energy from waste facilities from about, uh, it looks like about 15% to about 21%, uh, the amount of material that's going through energy from waste facilities. And you will see the, uh, 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 the amount of recycling material. That's the most dramatic jump there. It's gone from about 22% to about 42%. Communities that we work in within the United States, we know that enjoy uh, recycling in excess of 50%. A little bit about the project across the road. The project is owned by the region of Durham and the region of York. And it will process about 140,000 tons of metric, uh, metric tons of waste on an annual basis. And we will generate about 17 and a half megawatts of electricity. That's about enough power to go for, uh, for about 12 to 14,000 homes. It will be the cleanest uh, and most energy efficient energy from waste plant in North America. The plant is the most stringently permitted in North America and likely one of the most stringently permitted in the world. This plant will help the regions of Durham and the regions of York achieve their 70% diversion rate target. We will create about 700 jobs in the community, both direct and indirect, both construction and more than 40 uh, jobs on, a, on an operating basis in the facility. That's one of my favorite shots. So you can see our tip hall is fully formed there. Our residue building is now sheeted in. If you had really good eyes, you could see the assembly of the boiler. And there's some boiler components down there being lifted into position. And the air pollution control plant is pretty much installed at this point. The diesel fire water system, that fire water system will hold up to 300,000 gallons. We have two fire loops on the plant, one city and the other one's our own fire loop system. This is our residue handling building, and in the residue handling building is where we'll take out the ferrous and the non-ferrous material, and we will stabilize our APC residue at that point. Right now on site, about 280 jobs, or 280 employees on site all the time. Uh, we are extremely proud. We have hit the 400,000 man hour mark and not had a lost time accident. And when you look at the nature of the work over there, I think that's a great tribute to the tradesmen and to the uh, skilled forces that work in that facility. Nearly half of our costs for the costing on construction will be spent, so the community will enjoy a direct benefit of about $100 million of spending. Some of the local suppliers like Cocoa Paving, Miller Concrete, Baseline, uh, Vinon Sands, uh, printers, hotels, 
uh, restaurants have all enjoyed the benefit of having this influx of work and money being spent in the community. And they've been excellent to work with. We will create about 40 permanent jobs. And I heard one of the gentlemen down here chatting or asking a question about tradesmen. Uh, within hydro, and that is one of our great concerns. Uh, if you look around in the trades group, uh, we're all getting a little on the older side. Um, so we're starting to work with the University of Ontario on developing some trades folks. In about 19, pardon me, about 2005, 2006, Covana entered into the Clean World Initiative. Before that, we looked at how do we improve our facility operations, what do we do in research and development, advancement of solid waste management, and community partnerships. So here are some of the things that we have been working on. We have reduced our emissions by 50% in dioxin and mercury in that period of time. Our plants operate historically at about 65% below their legal permitted value. We've recovered about 362,000 tons of steel on an annual basis, and about 800,000 tons of CO2 is reduced. That's about 150,000 cars. One of the other things that I'm very excited about is we have a program in a number of our facilities called RX for Safety. They're one of the great issues in, in our society today is the amount of pharmaceuticals that are expired and are laying around people's homes and they need to be brought out of people's homes. So our clients and our, comp and our company have partnered with local communities to bring in drugs that are no longer of any use and will destroy them in our facility. We also, in a lot of our fishing communities, have worked with fishing for safety. Uh, fishing gear had historically just been allowed to uh, uh, been cut free and been allowed to drift out to sea. Now we work with the fishermen to encourage them to bring their fishing nets and their material that they want to dispose of to our facilities for safety. And we're also very proud of our partnership within the community, not to say the least our involvement with the Clearing Board of Trade, uh, University of Ontario, uh, the Oshawa Generals, and our Rotary Club here. So this picture that you're looking at here, we're getting pretty far along in production or in construction. These are what the superheaters that we talk about. So as the steam goes out through the boiler, it comes back out of the boiler through the superheaters where we raise the temperature. Those are superheater tendons before they're loaded into the boiler. This is our residue handling mill. Big opening there is where we're going to put the conveyors in for the bottom ash and the APC residue. And those are some more recent site pictures of the facility taken in October. And I'm sure most of you have noticed our stack, which I really like the lighting on. And thank you very much for your attention.